In this video, we'll be going over the setup process for an external analysis in flow simulation. And it'll also be a thermal cooling problem that takes into account natural convection. So some of the major steps we're going to look at are uh, running through the project wizard to create the project, adjusting the size of the computational domain, applying heat sources to the models, setting goals to track our key parameters during the solution, interpreting the results, and then also cloning the project to examine a geometry variation. There's timestamps in the video description if you want to jump ahead to any of these steps. Now, a couple things to point out. When you're setting up an external analysis, you'll want to consider how your model or product is used in reality. So is the heat sink in this case just floating in a giant volume of air, or is it mounted to some base? And for natural convection problems, they'll oftentimes be mounted to something. And we can see this has a pretty large difference in the airflow resulted. So we'll be including a component to represent the surface that this device is mounted to. There's plenty of other applications for uh, external analysis, such as aerodynamics problems, where it makes sense to have the object just floating in the computational domain. I should also point out that in this uh, simple tutorial, we're just analyzing a single heatsink, but flow simulation is capable of much more complex analyses with hundreds of components. So there'll be some resources in the description if you want to look at setup tips for more complex study types. Before we get started, you just want to make sure you have the flow simulation add-in loaded, either from the SOLIDWORKS add-ins tab on the command manager or going through tools, add-ins, and loading SOLIDWORKS flow sim. All right, so to begin our setup, I'll want to make sure I have the flow simulation add-in loaded up. And then I'll go and use the project wizard to create a new project. For my units, I'm just going to choose my temperature to be Celsius, since that's what I'm used to working in. I'm going to choose to make this an external analysis and enable heat conduction in solids, as well as gravity. I'll make sure my gravity is set to the Y component, which is how my assembly is oriented. We can see the arrow show up there to represent the Y direction. And that's important to represent our natural convection, uh, where the hot air will rise and cooler air will sink to form those convective currents. Without gravity enabled, the air won't be rising or sinking. For my default fluid, I'm going to choose air. And now we have a default solid screen, and I'm going to choose aluminum 5052. This will be applied to all components that don't have a specific material applied to them. On the final screen, I'll input my ambient temperature, which is going to be 25 degrees C, but this could be raised for elevated temperature testing. We could also input velocity for the flow in any given direction, uh, but for a natural convection problem, I want to leave all of these at zero. So we'll see this large gray box representing the computational domain. And just a quick note here on sizing the computational domain, the size of the domain can and will affect results accuracy, so it's important to choose the size of the computational domain that's adequate. Now you can see here three possible domain sizes presented, going from smallest to largest, from left to right. We'll be going for that middle of the road solution for this example, but uh, this is a parameter like mesh refinement that you can always clone your project and try using a larger or smaller domain and see how that affects the results. I want to resize this. I can do it kind of on the fly by clicking on the computational domain and dragging the handles. Or I can double click on the, the computational domain itself to enter the values here. And I'm going to enter half a meter in the positive and negative Z directions, which is the size of my base plate. And then for the Y min, I'm going to set that to 0. And the Y max, I'm going to set to 0.75. I'll click the check mark. I want to specify a solid material. So I'm going to insert a solid material. And again, this is for anything I don't want to be aluminum. 
I'm going to choose under glasses and minerals and choose insulator for the base. This is just because I don't want the base for this analysis to be able to conduct away any of the heat from my heat sink. I want to simulate a worst case scenario where all the heat is convected by the air. We're not really going to have any boundary conditions per se, so I'm going to go up under conditions and we'll be adding a heat source. We can add a surface or volume heat source here. To make my life a little bit easier, I'm just going to hit the tab key over the base to hide that, and then I'll go in and add a surface source. And now I can easily view the underside of this. And then I'll put a 80 watt heat source uh, into this face here. I can also activate a goal. So under goals, I'm going to check the checkbox for maximum temperature of the solid. And I'll label this. I'm just going to call this chip one heat source. And then I'll click the pin icon so I can place a second one. And I'm going to choose the smaller pad here and set a heat source of 25 watts and just call this chip two. We could use the templating here to automatically insert the number for us. And then X out of this. So now I've got my two heat sources, my two uh, goals set up. And if I just hit shift and tab while hovering my mouse over that base, it'll come back for me. Now I do want to pay a little bit of attention to the mesh this time. So we're going to edit the global mesh. And I'm going to enable this option for minimum gap size and type in a number of 10 millimeters, which is roughly the distance between the fins to make sure we resolve that in our simulation. That should be all the setup I need, so I can go ahead and run the analysis. We'll get the separate solver window popping up. Right now it's meshing the model, and then we'll see our goals plots available. You may just need to click the goals plot icon and choose the available goals to load them. And we'll see the temperature fluctuate at first, and then eventually begin to level off as the solution approaches convergence. This is why it's so important to use goals for convergence in our analyses, since it'll tell us when the steady state equilibrium has been reached. And we can see here that the temperature is already going way over 100 degrees Celsius. So that's probably going to be too hot for my application. We'll want to analyze a variant of this design later on. Once the solver is finished, I can close this window down and we'll begin interpreting the results. I'm going to start off by inserting a surface plot. We'll use all faces and I'll do 50 contours of temperature solid. This will show me the temperature distribution on the exterior of the heatsink. If I were to hide that base, I could also see the interior side. I'm also going to insert a cut plot. And I'll do a cut plot of velocity so we can see the airflow. So I'm going to do velocity here, and I'll also enable streamlines. So we can see the convective current that's being generated, removing the heat from the heatsink. If we switch this cut plot to temperature of the fluid, then we can actually see the hotter air in that area. Next, let's analyze a different version of the design. So I have another configuration with taller fins. I'm going to clone this project by right-clicking the project name and choosing clone and I'll select my full fins configuration. I'm going to say don't reset the computational domain or the mesh settings and then run this version. So these results are telling me that the interface between the heatsink and where the chips will mount is hitting about 80 degrees C. For more realism, of course, we could analyze the PCB itself with the electronics that go inside and incorporate that into our simulation. 
But here we can just load up the results and we'll see our convective currents and temperature distribution for this new variation. Again, we can hide our computational domain and even hide our global coordinate system if we want to clean up the results a little bit. If we want to insert flow trajectories here, I'll want to offset a plane. So I'll choose the top plane as a reference and then type in an offset such as 30 millimeters. Uh, actually, we might want more than that. You can freehand drag this to get it somewhere up into that area of the heat sinks, fins, and then we'll set a number of tubes, set a size for them, and click the check mark. And we can see how this shows us that the air is being drawn in and rising. Hopefully you found this video helpful and let us know in the comments what kind of content you'd like to see next.